speech, the Cooper Union Address, in depth. And our presenter this morning is Linda Walvoord DeVelder. And as many of you may know, Linda is a Hope College graduate, receiving her BA from, from Hope, and also her MA and PhD from the University of uh, Chicago. Linda is an experienced uh, academic educator in uh, literature, and we're welcome Great to have her here, and we'll want to welcome everyone, so I'll turn it over to Linda. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to have a significant group of HASP people ready to enjoy this speech today. I'm particularly happy that we were able to locate such an effective delivery of the speech to um, <clears throat> offer you online because uh, otherwise I'd have to try to do it myself and you wouldn't, that wouldn't be nearly as successful. Um, because a speech is something that occurs in the air verbally for a live audience, but that's not true with this particular speech. And our subject today is the power of Lincoln's Cooper Union speech. After all, Congress is full of speeches. There are speeches every day. The pulpits around the country are full of speeches. People hear them every week. A typical sermon in the old days might be an hour long. When people think of a long speech today, they think of something that must be long and boring. So how do you make a speech this long be this powerful? So I'd like to, um, if, you, if you were able to tap into the recording of the speech and listen to each le at least part of it, wave your hand so Steve can see how many um, of you were able to listen to part of this speech or all of it. What do you see, Steve? Um, I, I'm just seeing you right now. <laughs> oh, I see. I thought uh, you could see the participants. Well, I, I will here in just a second. I saw quite a few hands waving. Okay. okay. We Thanks. had a significant number who not only read, uh, read the first nine or 10 pages at least of the speech, but listened to it. And if you have time this coming week after we've introduced it this morning, I encourage you to really listen to the speech the way it was first delivered. However, Lincoln also knew that he had a much wider audience than just the people in this auditorium. So let's go ahead and look now at the auditorium that um, uh, he filled. No way. Yes. This is a representation of that day published in some newspaper or book of Cooper Union Auditorium. And if you look at the columns and the arches and the size of the place, people were just amazed and excited to even see a room this big. This um, was not only the largest auditorium in New York City, but as far as one historian knows, it was the largest indoor room in the United States. So there were many representations of that day of how that, uh, how that room looked. Now we know that there were no microphones. So if you can imagine Lincoln at the very front of this room trying to project his speech, you would guess that only the first three rows or five rows could even hear it. But that is not true. He was able to project his voice in this auditorium to reach this entire large audience. The seating capacity in the room is, I think it was 1,500, but that sounds too low to me. Um, but 1,500 people without a microphone requires an enormous voice, and Lincoln had it. And when you listen to the Sam Waterston enactment of the speech, um, you will see that by the time he finishes, and he's a trained actor, he knows how to manage his voice, his voice must be tired because he too has tried to project the points where Lincoln um, uh, raises the energy level quite high. Now the delivery, Lincoln had a large audience that was not only the people in this room. 
And he, this speech is the power of his presidency because if he had not given the Cooper Union speech on February 27 of 1860, he would never have become president. It's not that he was unknown when he stepped to the stage, but he was unknown as this type of orator. Out West, the people in the East had heard that Lincoln was this famous stump speaker and maybe a very successful country lawyer and that he had faced Douglas in the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, but they didn't know that he was gonna deliver the logic, the clarity, and the real power in their terms of this speech. In addition, Lincoln knew that his speech would be published and it was published widely in newspapers of the time. So when you listen to it, um, you'll realize that we are both an audience able to hear an actor deliver it and an audience able to read the speech in print. But so were people of that time. And his largest audience was his reading audience who read the speech after it was delivered. And yes, a speech of this length was published in numerous newspapers word for word. And of course, since Lincoln had delivered a copy of this speech a, a printed or maybe handwritten copy of this speech to the press for publication, it could be printed immediately. Um, what are the elements of the delivery of a speech? Well, I'm gonna give you five key words, all starting with P, that you'll think about as you watch Sam Waterston and listen to him deliver this speech. First, there's pause. The way he uses pause creates emphasis, emphasis and unity and coherence in the speech. There's pitch and pitch is the level at which you raise your voice or lower your voice. So pitch is the up and down of the voice. There's pacing. So in some places you'll see Watterson speak quickly because he's able to make the sentence come across by speaking quickly. And at other places, he slows way down. There is one sentence in the speech that maybe you noticed where Lincoln says, now that is cool. And the first time I saw that, I laughed because I didn't realize that in Lincoln's time, people were already using, whoa, that's cool the way we use it today. Now that is cool. So that would be pacing, slowing way down. And then, so you have pause, pitch, pacing and then projection and an actor or singer knows how to project his or her voice where it's not going to be loud all the time you can't keep people listening if you shout at them for an hour we've all learned this at home haven't we um <laughs> if you raise your voice and keep it up at that pitch you're losing all the power of the english language to contrast loud and soft, a high pitch and a low pitch, and your pacing as you speak quickly. Now there's one more that, well, there's one more aspect of delivery that, and construction that I wanna emphasize here that starts with P, and that is the periodic sentence. The periodic sentence means a sentence in which subordination like subordinate clauses, has helped the speaker to construct a sentence so that the power is at the end. If I say, um, I'm going to be a teacher after I graduate from college, that's not as effective as saying, after I graduate from college, I'm going to be a teacher. If you say, you're the most beautiful woman in the world, although many women have their charms. That doesn't work. But if you say, although many women have their charms, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. Now that's a periodic sentence. So you see what I mean, where the subordination to the way the sentence is constructed and then the way it's delivered creates power at the end of the sentence. And Waterston and Lincoln both knew the power of constructing sentences that way. 
So for next week, as you listen to this speech and read the last part of it or read it again, I'd like everyone to pick at least one sentence that you admire that is long, that you think has that power. Look for your favorite periodic sentence where um, um, Lincoln steadily understands how to do this and how to write these. Um, many of Lincoln's sentences have between 40 and 60 words in them. Now, some of us might say, well, as a writing teacher, I would tell my students to chop that up, shorten your sentences. You can't write sentences that long. Or they'll say, that's a run-on sentence. And they'll say it's a run-on sentence because it's long. Well, it's not a run-on sentence because it's long. It's a run-on sentence because it's not properly subordinated or punctuated. So run-on sentence refers to grammar. But a long sentence can very well be grammatical and very effective. So that's a little bit of comment on the way Lincoln is writing this speech. So a hall this size is going to be, um, could have been intimidating to Lincoln because he'd never even been to New York. I believe he'd never been to the state of New York or to the East before he was ready to give this speech. And um, recently a book has come out by Harold Holzer, who in the Sam Waterston recording introduces Lincoln uh, representing William Cullen Bryant. But he has recently published a whole book on the significance of the Cooper Union speech. And what we can appreciate is that not only do we see it today as extremely important because it did make him president or helped to, but it had a massive power at the time it was published. Um, it had massive circulation during 1860 after February 27th. It was praised by editors at the time and, as I said, reprinted in several papers at the time. It has spectacular organization and style of sentences, and it had at least three audiences. The large audience he knows he will have when it's printed, the reading audience. The audience of Southerners, who of course are not in his audience on that day, unless a few for some reason came. And yet the whole middle section that we've just started for today is addressed to Southerners and says you to them. Now that middle section is going to talk to the Southerners as a dramatic technique in order to create a refutation section. You say we're sectional. I reply, then he gives his answer. You say that we, um, uh, that we slander you. And then he responds to that. That's called refutation where you bring up the main points of your opponent and then you answer them. It's a structured part of debate, as we probably know, to be able to answer. Lincoln's speech as a whole defines both himself and the Republican Party. What he presented in this speech did prove powerful enough politically to unify the Republican Party because he knew what his audience already accepted or believed or wanted and how to shape his speech around that, around the subject of control of slavery in the territories. In other words, he did not structure a, the speech around some grand theme like, is slavery uh, right or wrong? He'll get to that later in the speech, but a very narrow question which he lays on the table right away. This photo by Matthew Brady was taken the day of the Cooper Union speech. And so it was by appointment. And if anyone expected a ragamuffin to step forth in Cooper Union Hall, they would see another man by the end of the speech because of the power of his speech. If you look at this photo closely, you can see that his suit is a little rumpled. You see some creases in it. Brady was able to kind of move past that and capture this Lincoln, which has such stature. His height is emphasized. There's a column in the background, which we don't quite see, which emphasizes his height. And then his hand positioned on the books. And the most of all, the expression of his face, which is, I think, beautifully presidential. And so um, 
he came to Cooper Union looking like this and with a voice that could carry in that hall and if either one of them had been missing. Here's a um, contemporary illustration drawn for the newspapers of the Cooper Union Hall and Lincoln giving his speech and um, New Yorkers, as we will see, just gave him a standing ovation at the end of this speech. The weather was balmy that night, even though it was the end of February. The suit was new, but Mary wasn't there and neither were there any valets in the hotel that could quickly take his suit for a press. He wore brand new shoes he had just bought and he had to walk several blocks with his fellow Republicans to get to the hall. And by the time he got there, he was limping because his shoes were too tight. So, and he came to New York all by himself. Think about the entourage of attendants and valets and people waiting upon him and secretaries that a presidential candidate today travels with in order to be, have that perfect hairdo and the perfect suit and every detail taken care of. Lincoln came to New York alone in a train that must have taken at least 20 hours. <clears throat> this is a picture of Cooper Union. Cooper Union was a college ahead of its time. Not only did they admit women, but um, shortly after John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, which occurred late in 1859, there was a speech in this hall that presented the significance of John Brown in a positive way. And of course, both the North and the South were horrified by what had happened at Harper's Ferry. Peter Cooper was an early philanthropist who had developed America's first steam locomotive and Peter Cooper himself ran for president in 1878. So it was a hall noted for progressive thinking, new ideas and progressive education. And of course the beauty and stature of this building um, makes it sort of presidential as well. I wanna remind you that throughout his life, Lincoln's image was taken many times and Brady was, Matthew Brady was often the one taking the pictures. And so these are two of the most uh, well, the, the one on the left is, I believe, the last photo taken of Lincoln after the Civil War. And so we can see physically what happened to Lincoln during the war, how he changed in those four years. Isn't that dramatic? There's a book called The Faces of Lincoln, which tries to capture every photo of his face that was taken in those four years, and it is an amazing array of images. The one on the left looks quite different, gives you a different feeling than the, than the one on the right. And then here are two others that if the photo on the left here had been used as his photo as a candidate for president, I don't think he would have been elected. And on the one on the right, again, emphasizes his sometimes uh, bad hair days and ragged, rough look. Although in my opinion, Lincoln was handsome. Um, here's another photo of Lincoln that makes him look contemplative. And I wonder what some of you think this captures in the look of Lincoln. Jot a few things down and we'll take it up for discussion later on as we discuss the image of Lincoln that's being created by this speech and by the um, events of the next few weeks. This is a quote from a speech Lincoln gave in 1858, two years before the Cooper Union. And it shows that Lincoln had already taken a very clear position on slavery and attributed to the Republican Party itself, which was still in the process of formation and self-definition. The Republican Party hold, and he doesn't say holds, he treats party as a communal now, the Republican Party hold that this government was instituted to secure the blessings of freedom and that slavery is an unqualified evil to the Negro, to the white man, and to the state. Look at the emphasis in that, in that statement. He's not just saying slavery is evil, an unqualified evil, and not just bad for the slave. 
to the slave, to the white man, and to the state. This is one example also of a periodic sentence that has a build to it. Now, as we look at the um, attitudes in the South, I want to just briefly point out, and I'm not going to linger on this because I, we want to get to the speech quickly today, but there was a rebellion in Haiti beginning in 1791. Haiti is an island just a little bit off of Florida. You can see here Florida and you can see Haiti and it's less than 500 miles and maybe less than 300 from the tip of Florida to Haiti. You see Charleston up there at the top of the map. And it's no more distant to go from Charleston to Haiti than it is to go from Charleston to Boston. And so everyone in the South realized that Haiti was not that far from the United States. So if in Haiti, not more than 10,000 planters could be overwhelmed by the 100,000 slaves on that island, anybody could project that if a rebellion broke out and the slaves had means of communication, they could overwhelm the whites on that island. Um, and the revolution in Haiti was bloody. It was a repeated jockeying between Britain, Spain, France, and the rebelling natives as to who was going to control that item, that island over the next 20 years. And the face-off in Haiti was extremely bloody, violent, and barbaric. Here's another image that shows you the whole East Coast and the sea lanes that were bringing the ships from Europe around across the West Indies, then up along the American coast, and then back to Europe on those routes that you see. So you can again see Haiti in relationship to the East Coast. Um, Southerners were quick to want to ban any slaves being imported from Haiti after the revolution. Some planters who had lost their plantations in Haiti moved to Louisiana and Alabama, and they were afraid that those slaves remembered what had happened and that it would provoke rebellion here. After the rebellion in Haiti and after the um, Nat Turner Rebellion, which happened in 1832, Nat Turner had been able to read and he seemed like a good slave until he led a rebellion. And so the black codes that forbade them to gather, forbade them to learn to read, to show this tremendous fear of slaves being able to communicate with each other or read or travel. And the fear that even a good slave who seemed to be loving, kind and obedient toward his master and was a quote, good slave could turn into a rebel slave quickly uh, after they saw the Nat Turner Rebellion be quickly put down, but it was a rebellion. So we're not going to spend any more time on this right now. Instead, I'm going to um, uh, go to the beginning of the speech. Let's see. Um, I need to stop the video now. Um, Susan, um, when we say a reading audience for this speech, I think, do I, there we go. When we say there was a, yes, and we're, re, we're almost ready for the first clip here. Um, but when we say reading audience, um, a couple of facts. Newspapers were not in general circulation before about 1840. But in the 1840s, paper became cheap enough and printing became cheap and quick enough that they could publish newspapers that cost only a penny and put them in the, in the streets on a reasonably fast basis, like in modern times. And the reading public was expanding and public education was increasing to the point where people could lead, read and teach others to read so that the reading public became a real thing in America after the 1840s. And um, 
So many people were able to follow the Lincoln-Douglas debates who couldn't go to the debates. And it creates what we have now, which is a huge reading public looking at the major speeches that a candidate gives. Okay, if we could look at the first clip then now, Susan, for, from the speech. <clears throat> um, no, I don't hear anything Mr. yet. President and fellow citizens of New York. Okay. The fact with which I would. It's very faint on my audio. Oh, here's my favorite button. will deal this evening are mainly old and familiar, nor is there anything new in the general use I shall make of them. If there shall be any novelty, it will be in the mode of presenting the facts and the inferences and observations following that presentation. In his speech last autumn at Columbus, Ohio, as reported in the New York Times, Senator Douglas said, our fathers, when they framed the government under which we live, understood this question just as well and even better than we do now. I fully endorse this, and I adopt it as a text for this discourse. I so adopt it because it furnishes a precise and an agreed starting point for a discussion between Republicans and that wing of the democracy headed by Senator Douglas. It simply leaves the inquiry. What was the understanding those fathers had of the question mentioned? What is the frame of government under which we live? The answer must be the Constitution of the United States. That Constitution consists of the original framed in 1787, and under which the present government first went into operation, and 12 subsequently framed amendments, the first 10 of which were framed in 1789. Who were our fathers that framed the Constitution? I suppose the 39 who signed the original instrument may be fairly called our fathers, who framed that part of the present government. It is almost exactly true to say they framed it, and it is altogether true to say they fairly represented the opinion and sentiment of the whole nation at that time. Their names being familiar to nearly all and acceptable, accessible to quite all need not now be repeated. I take these 39 for the present as being our fathers who framed the government under which we live. What is the question which, according to the text, those fathers understood just as well and even better than we do now? It is this. Does the proper division of local and federal authority or anything in the Constitution forbid our federal government to control as to slavery in our federal territory. How they expressed that better understanding. In 1784, three years before the Constitution, the United States then owning the Northwestern Territory and no other, the Congress of the Confederation had before them the question of prohibiting slavery in that territory. And four of the 39 who afterward framed the Constitution were in that Congress and voted on that question. Of these, Roger Sherman, Thomas Mifflin, and Hugh Williamson voted for the prohibition, thus showing that in their understanding, no line 
dividing local from federal authority, nor anything else, properly forpaid the federal government to control as to slavery in federal territory. All right, now I want to come back. Now, can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you, Linda. Okay. All right, we're going to stop right here because I selected a couple of clips and we jumped from the first one to the second one. I'm still getting used to this tech here. You heard the very first part of the speech. And now I'd like to hear just some impressions from a few people. Steve, if you've got any, any questions on chat or if anyone has any comments about the, about where we, what we were saying in the beginning and what you notice, um, what you notice about the speech as you hear this part of it. Hey, Linda, there are currently no questions on the chat function. Okay. Would anyone else like to ask a question by unmuting their microphone? Yes, I'd like to make a comment that hearing Sam Watterson speak this and do it so eloquently is far preferable to reading it. When I read this and I saw all those long sentences, I thought, how many people are going to read past the first five pages and get the gist of this speech or get the meat of the speech? But hearing Watterson presented it is just outstanding. Thank you, Judy, because that long phrase about does anything um, does anything stand in the, does anything in the Constitution forbid the federal government to control for slavery in the territories is probably going to be repeated in the speech at least 15 times. And it becomes, by the time he gets to the later repetitions of this, his live audience, as he's giving this in 2004 to a live audience in Lincoln Center, his audience is smiling and laughing. Oh yeah, here it is again. You know, he's putting his, his thesis sentence on the table over and over and over again until, oh yeah, I know exactly what he means. Um, and so in this first section, he doesn't start with any jokes. He doesn't start with any anecdotes about his trip to New York. He doesn't start with any comments about New Yorkers. He goes straight for the jugular in the beginning. And that very beginning, he just says, Mr. President and fellow citizens of New York, the facts with which I shall deal this, even, this evening are mainly old and familiar. It's like, I'm not going to tell you anything new. I'm just going to tell you old facts. How boring could that be? nor is there anything new in the general use I shall make of them. If there shall be any novelty, it will be in the mode of presenting the facts and the inferences and observations following that presentation. That's his, tell them what you're going to tell them. But it is a um, deceptively simple, clear, and straightforward, and some would say dull. This is what Judy's saying. Some would say that's a dull opening. Um, would, would you, Judy? It's clear. Yes. But for his audience, the first thing he does is quote Senator Douglas and agree with Douglas. Now that will wake them up because everybody knows that Lincoln and Douglas are right now the primary opponents for the dream of becoming president of the United States. So to agree with your opponent is a good starting point, but they're gonna say, well, Douglas is saying that the forefathers were pro-slavery and tolerant of slavery, and they're claiming that they wrote slavery right into the Constitution. And so Douglas, by opening and saying, our fathers, when they pr framed the government under which we live, understood this question, meaning slavery, just as well and even better than we do now. Now, when we say this question here, it wasn't just slavery. It was control of slavery in the territories. And one of the big misconceptions about the Civil War <clears throat> and about the election of 1860 is that it was 
about slavery in a general way. Well, yes, it was, but it was in specifics about the control of slavery in the territories. Did the federal government have the right to say, no, Missouri may not write a slave-friendly con uh, constitution because the federal government has the power to prohibit that. And that was an issue of the times and that was what they were arguing about in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, Suzanne, Suzanne Harrington, you have your microphone on. Did you have a question? I was just going to say he encapsulates so well what his topic is going to be about, what his yeah. efforts are all toward. That's all. Yeah. Yes. And how many of us have taken a public speaking class where the teacher says, narrow your topic, narrow your topic, get your topic down to what you're going to stick to. And so he's gotten it pretty narrow, hasn't he, to, to, to say it this way. Linda, it's Kim. Yeah. Uh, you have one other question or comment from Richard Byrne asking, what is the difference between the time of this speech and Jesse Helms, mm. Strom Thurmond, and Herman Talmadge, who promoted segregation well into the 70s? Uh, segregation is just a lower level of support of discrimination. Uh, well, Strom Thurmond and Jesse Helms are 20th century senators. They would date, do they not, to the 60s and to the 1960s and 70s? Right. Uh huh. Um, well, the time difference would be 110 years difference. And this, this is a significant question because. We, none of the issues raised in the Cooper Union are dead issues completely. Almost everything that was behind the promotion and acceptance of slavery is also behind the promotion and acceptance of a non-integrated society, a segregated society. So it is true that the battle over segregation was a reiteration, a repeat in many ways of the same arguments and the same ideas that were driving the growing difference between the North and the South um, on whether an integrated society would even be desirable. However, in Lincoln's Republican audience at that time, most of those people believed that slavery should be abolished, but they would not have believed that there should be or could be an integrated society. To step to the question of, of whether segregation is right was would be, you know, another chapter to be played out in the 20th century. Good question. Linda? Yes. I, I have a comment about uh, the, the effectiveness, I think, of, of Lincoln referring early to uh, Senator Douglas's um, comment and especially this reference to our fathers. I noted, and one of the values of having a, a file that you can do searches for terms, I counted 20 times where a reference is made to our fathers or our founding fathers. And that was one way to unify uh, his, his audience, I think, because who in that audience, who in any audience in the United States at that time would have wa not wanted to see the founding fathers as authoritative? Yes. Good point. And the Founding Fathers is, is, is being carefully defined in this speech, not just some general idea <clears throat> that it's anyone who was part of the revolutionary world as a politician, but specifically the 39 men who signed the Constitution. That's it. That's who he's talking about. And so he went through the congressional records at great pains to identify how each one of those 39 men had voted in Congress on laws or issues that involved the control of slavery in order to prove that of the 39, if we look at page, everything he's doing from page two in your copy through page 
six. Everything in pages two through six is a historical proof that 21 of the 39 founding fathers acted in Congress, passed, act, uh, voted on acts in Congress in a way that showed that in their understanding, no line dividing local from federal authority nor anything in the Constitution was um, stood in the way of prohibiting slavery in the federal territory. And he takes them by name and one by one, and he takes them chronologically through a historical summary. So if you look at the top of page six, we have a key turning point in the speech where Lincoln comes to his conclusion from what he has just shown on the previous pages. Here then we have 23 out of our 39 fathers who framed the government under which we live, borrowing that from Douglas, who have upon their official responsibility and their corporate oaths acted upon the very question which the text affirms they understood just as well and even better than we do now. And 21 of them, a clear majority of the whole 39, so acting upon it as to make them guilty of gross political impropriety and willful perjury if they had voted the way they did and still believed that the federal government had no power to control for slavery. So the way they voted shows that they believed that the federal government did have the power to control for slavery in the territories. <clears throat> and then at the end of that paragraph at the top of page six, thus the 21 acted, and as actions speak louder than words, so actions under such responsibility speak still louder. So in other words, listen to what, look at what they do, not what they say. And he's looking at what they did and proving that they agreed with what Douglas said, um, but he's, pr he's proceeding to show that a majority of the forefathers believed that, um, believed that the federal government had power to control for slavery. Now, then he makes an exception but, in the next paragraph. But yeah. they're, they're in the core of it, it boils down to states' rights versus federal rights. Well, that's the way the South was putting it. The, the South, the way the South wanted to define states' rights, no one had any power in any developing state or territory to tell them what to do about slavery. And that's what they were having problems with here because they were trying to incorporate new states and whose influence would have the rights over those states, because at that point, that territory had no, had no voice. Yes, and Lincoln is laying down the groundwork to show that when the United States passed the Northwest Ordinance in 1787, in other words, our founding fathers passed that ordinance, the Ordinance of 1787 controls for slavery in everything that was included in the territories at that time. So it did in fact control for slavery by prohibiting slavery in the territories. So if, so Lincoln's answer to the state's rights argument is, well, you can take that position, but it's not what the founding fathers believed. They said, you're not in line with the founding fathers if you wanna say state's rights because the founding fathers believed and acted in a way that the federal government did have power and used it to control and limit for slavery in the territories. And then he proves that over and over again in the, citing the, the actions that, we, that he just went through on pages two through six. Now he backs off a little bit. I, a important transition on page six is that second paragraph says two of the 23 voted against congressional prohibition of slavery in the federal territories in the instances in which they acted on that. But for what reasons they voted is not known. So then he points out that one of these, it might have been for expediency. Then he makes an important point in that paragraph. He says, a congressman can vote for something, cannot conscientiously vote for something if he thinks that it's not constitutional. If he thinks it's against the Constitution in his understanding, he cannot vote for it. 
no matter how expedient or convenient or favorable to his party, that move may be. He can vote for it only if he considers it both constitutional and doable or expedient. But you can't vote it in just because it's expedient. So he's arguing that of those, of those, those last two of the 23, may have once or twice voted in a way that seemed to um, be states' rights. But in fact, um, we don't know for what reason they did that. Now he goes down to the remain here. Now then in the next section after page six, he's going to say, all right, we've nailed down the 21. We have shown that 21 framers of the Constitution believed that Congress had the power to control for slavery in the territories. End of subject. He, and I think that when we listen to how he deals with each one, we have to agree at the top of page six that he has nailed down the 21. Now he's going to talk about the other 16. 39 minus 21 leaves 16 that supposedly we are not sure about. And he says on the third paragraph, as far as those 16 are concerned, I searched all the records and we don't have any record of their understanding upon the direct question of federal control of slavery in the territories. But there is much reason to believe that their understanding upon that question would not have appeared different than that of the other 23, had it been manifested at all. So he's saying to the state's rights people, well, you can claim all you want that because they were silent, they never voted on any questions like this, therefore they were on your side. But Lincoln is saying, um, that he doesn't think it would have been different from the first 21. He doesn't think the 16 would have been different from the first 21. And then he adds, and by the way, among those 16 were Benjamin Franklin. Well, Benjamin Franklin <clears throat> believed in control of slavery. And Alexander Hamilton, who also believed in control of slavery. And um, Governor Morris, another character from the revolution who clearly was not um, in a pro-slavery category. At the Linda, bottom, I, I wonder why he didn't include Jefferson in those. Jefferson, oh, he's going to include Jefferson as he gets through the whole speech. He's going to claim Jefferson was a Republican also. He's going to claim that the Republicans are squarely within the Jeffersonian dream. And he quotes, he, he quotes Jefferson as saying toward the end of his life that his dream was, was, a, was that the United States would be a confederacy of free states, very clearly showing that although Jefferson had tangled feelings about his own ownership of slaves, he did have the dream that the, the country as a whole would find a way to eradicate slavery. So Jefferson fits Lincoln's plan. So does George Washington fit this plan because he mentions George Washington several times later in the speech. So by the end of the speech, he has claimed that following the Republican dream were Washington, Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, all of them, well, I'm not, Hamilton wasn't a slave owner, but, um, and neither was Franklin, but Washington and Jefferson are usually considered by the Virginians to be pure Southern, you know, leaders who were presidents who therefore owned slaves and therefore must have been on the side of states' rights. But Lincoln is saying, wait a minute, Jefferson is actually a Republican. Jefferson is actually in line with what he's saying in this speech because he had a dream that slavery would be abolished. And the South at this time has developed the idea that slavery is so good for mankind that it must be extended. They, it sounds unbelievable to us today to think that anybody would say that. Slavery is so good for mankind that it must be extended. Um, and he's claiming that Washington, that all of the founding fathers assumed and presumed and hoped and wished and prayed that slavery would eventually be eradicated in the future of the United States. In fact, at the bottom of page six, Lincoln is claiming that there was not a single one of the 39 
who was not known to have been on his side unless it was John Rutledge of South Carolina. Well, John Rutledge of South Carolina, I believe, fired the first shot at Fort Sumter. So he was a died in the wool, states rights to the point of rebellion person. On page seven, Lincoln is also summarizing and leading forward. And here's a transition paragraph here. But so far, I've been considering the understanding of the question manifested by the framers of the Constitution in the original instrument. But then we also have the amendments. And then he goes into the subject of the amendments. And he's now going to move to a consideration of the 76 members of the Congress that passed the, passed the, Constitu passed the Constitution and signed uh, the 76 members of that Congress at that time. And he's proving that they, again and again, restricted slavery. Now I'm going to just highlight some of the other turning points in the speech that we'll notice as you read on through it and, and reread it and listen to all of Sam Waterston's delivery. At the bottom of page eight, Lincoln finishes the first section of his speech. Throughout this whole first section, it's been a history lesson proving that the actions of Congress back up his claim that the federal government has the power to control for slavery in the territories. And that if you deny that, then you have a very original idea that was not part of the founding fathers plan. He says, but enough. And at that point in this recording that we're listening to, the audience laughs. His audience in 2004 that Sam Waterston is giving this to at Lincoln Center laughs. So on the top of page nine, he's going to start the next section of the speech where he's talking to the Southern people. And um, let's look ahead now and tag the different things that he says to the Southern people, that this, he says that they say. I'd like to hear some comments now on how you feel about this upcoming section of the speech that we're gonna discuss more next week. But we've gotten into it a little bit with what I asked you to read for today. Um, so how does this paragraph sound? Um, I don't think I want to go back to, I think we'll go back to the recording next time for the other clips that I reserve because they relate more to the latter part of the speech. In each one of these, you see that the paragraph said, I would say to them, you consider yourselves a reasonable and a just people. And I consider that in the general qualities of reason and justice, you, the Southerners, are not inferior to any other people. Now, who is he actually speaking to here? Do you, it's, I think we established it doesn't mean very many of his immediate audience in 1860 who are sitting in that auditorium because they're mostly New Yorkers. They're not Southerners and they're mostly Republicans already as they come into the, <clears throat> as to come into the speech. So who is he speaking to in his mind or for this dramatic section? Anyone? Maybe, maybe Southerners who might be reading it in a newspaper later? I think yes, definitely. He was hoping that would be true, although we historians don't think that this speech was circulated in print in the South very much. Speaking to Northerners who are sympathetic or unsympathetic to the Southern's point of view. You know, when you go into the refutation part of an, of an oration or a debate, one of the important fair play principles that all the teachers of debate will teach you is you have to be fair to the other side. You have to not caricature or twist what they say. 
And so you have to, and you have to not be mean while you're refuting someone. You, so is but, he, but but in here he says that in effect the southerners are call, calling the, the northerners the republicans reptiles that's that's the use of dehumanizing animal imagery there it, that's that's, that's, that's right quite so, onto, that, that's that jumped out at me because it didn't sound like he was just sounding earlier in the speech he is getting worked up in this section and yes. when we when you listen to how waterston treats this he's going to portray that combination of some mockery, some satire on Lincoln's part, and a really heartfelt, you are slandering us, to call the Republicans black Republicans. He's saying the only way that we're referred to down south is as black Republicans, as if we're so um, enamored with the Negro race that we want to march into the south and eradicate slavery, and that's our plan. And they were being caricatured. The North was being caricatured that way. And Lincoln in particular, this speech was, the, many of Lincoln's speeches were treated as a threat by Lincoln that if he won the presidency, he planned to immediately assemble, um, assemble an army and march into the South and burn and destroy and take away their slaves. Well, that's what had happened in Haiti but that was the rebel slaves. That wasn't Lincoln leading his armies. There had been a revolution in Haiti, but it was a slave revolt. The Southerners were imagining that Lincoln had a plan from the beginning and that he just wasn't admitting it in his speeches. The, they were just lacking, com completely lacking in trust that Lincoln meant what he said. And when he said that he had no goal of disturbing slavery where it already existed, they didn't believe him. So he's pleading with the South to listen and give the North credit for saying what they actually believe and not trying to just pull the wool over someone's eyes or get elected president so they can gather their army and come down and destroy the South. It was just ridiculous um, fear mongering that the Southerners were the Southern oligarchy, the slave owners who pretty much controlled each state by now, uh, were telling their ordinary people that if Republican wins, we're going to war. And they were being quite deliberate about that, deliberate about saying, if a Republican is elected, we're going to war. And there was, that was fed by the fact that the previous two presidents, Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan, were both very Southern sympathetic men, very willing to tolerate slavery where it was, and also to tolerate the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, and to um, the Dred Scott decision was crucial in um, turning the Supreme Court um, toward the interpretation that um, if a slave owner brings a slave into a free state, he still owns the slave and slavery has to be tolerated in that state because a Southerner brought a, state, brought a slave up here. Therefore, if a slave owner brings a slave to Massachusetts, he has a perfect right to bring his gang of slaves to Massachusetts and keep them as slaves because they were slaves in Virginia. And Massachusetts has nothing to say about it. That's the kind of argument that the South was beginning to perpetrate and that the Dred Scott decision seemed to, un seemed to give its blessing to. The essential question there in the Dred Scott decision was does the Constitution view a slave as human property. Can a person own another person? And Lincoln is saying, no, the Constitution doesn't say that. And Stephen Douglas was believing, and other Southern orators were believing, yet that, that yes, the Constitution does define a slave as property. And since the Constitution protects a person's property, yes, you can bring a gang of slaves out to Kansas or Nebraska or um, a, you know, to a new state or to an existing state and set up your plantation. And because they were slaves back home, Massachusetts doesn't have anything to say about it or Pennsylvania or New York or New Jersey or Illinois. Stephen Douglas owned a plantation in Mississippi. That was one of his main sources of income. And when he gave his speeches, he would dress up like a planter. He had this white ruffled shirt 
a long blue coat with glass, brass buttons and light trousers and a broad brimmed hat. So he looked like he was just stepped off the plantation and he was trying very hard to hold the sympathy, sympathy of the Southerners with his popular sovereignty you know, position that only the people matter. And if somebody, if enough slaveholders come to Kansas, then Kansas will be a slaveholding state and nobody has anything to say about it. Good question. Are there any other questions like that? Uh, John Cobbs, your mic is on. Did you have a question, sir? Well, I was trying to comment that uh, in this particular paragraph, Lincoln seems to be doing two things. Uh, one, he's reaching out to what I think he would consider moderate Southerners, undecideds. And secondly, in, the, in referring to the polarization of North and South, which the South clearly blames North. He's flipping the cause. It's not us. It's the radicals among you. And if you don't believe that, prove it. Pick enough, we That's can't how hear I the audio. That, that paragraph. Okay, we lost a little bit of the Did audio Did you get the there, question in? Um, on you, John. I got the gist of it. You're, you're pointing out that Lincoln is turning the tables here and saying, you're the ones who are being radical and caricaturing us and slandering us with things that are completely unfair. And you're stoking warmongering and fearmongering by your way of addressing the North. Yeah, exactly right. He's reaching, but he's reaching out to the moderates in the South until, until after the election, Lincoln truly believed that there were ordinary people in the South who support and who were not interested in slandering the Republicans or being just cruelly unreasonable in, in their attitudes. They were, they were hoping to find a place to have debate. But I, I think you're right, John, that he's saying if the debate becomes impossible, then we will go to war. If trusting in the Congress and in the way the North and the South in war. This is February of 1860. What would be the situation a 